MBS's dark side had been steadily revealing itself. The Crown Prince Mohammed bin Salman personally approved the murder of the exiled journalist Jamal Khashoggi. MBS launched and steadily escalated a war in Yemen. He took the Prime Minister of Lebanon hostage and doesn't stop at sports. This episode of World Corrupt is brought to you by Zbiotics Pre-Alcohol Probiotic. Your first drink for a better tomorrow. Welcome back to World Corrupt Season 2. This is Episode 2. That second track on that always difficult second album. Hope it goes better for us than it did for the Strokes. Let's aim high, Tommy. Pray we at least hit the heady heights of Weezer Pinkerton levels. I don't know, Raj. I think Hootie and the Blowfish might be a more apt comparison. Oh, and Tommy V, I do like to think of you as a gen not unlike Darius Rucker, always taking the escape route and just reinventing himself as a country singer. It's no one. I only want to be with you. <laughs> Sorry, I can't sing for shit. <laughs> I was going to say Norkin Darius Rucker, but then I got completely overwhelmed by fear of just an army, a legion of Darius Rucker fans. You know, the Rucker hive just coming and attacking us. I'm not going to make that joke. But seriously, if hosting podcasts about the intersection of sports and geopolitics doesn't work out, it does seem like that could be the next logical step here. But I have no doubt that you, Tommy Vito, will maybe one day be hosting the Darius Rucker Intercollegiate Golf Tournament. Before you know it, there could be there could be worse alternate realities. I, honestly, before we came in, I Googled this, and I did come away with more questions than answers about why Darius Rucker is hosting a golf tournament. Regardless. It's America. <laughs> this series is about Saudi Arabia's investment in soccer and why they are dumping billions and billions of dollars into the global game, why they're doing it, what they hope to get in return, and what it means for the future of soccer and, you know, the rest of the world. Uh, it's honestly, Swiller, like we're all left anyway. I kid, I kid, we're not. We kind of are, but we're not for the purposes of this show, Tommy. Let's still hold on to hope. Uh, and we should say, if you didn't listen to our first episode in the series, the one that was on Saudi Arabia's quite astonishing, sudden, surging investment across the world of football, uh, it'd be great if you did say so. it will certainly help this episode make a lot more sense to you but we are going to take a look back at how saudi arabia got to this place of enormous influence in the world because on paper saudi arabia is not an obvious geopolitical juggernaut a bit like belgium in football because on a map you stay with me here tommy belgium looks a bit like oh francis sad little hat <laughs> but then they take the field and they crush you with that aforementioned sad little chapeau just like Belgium. Let's just run with that. Now, Saudi Arabia didn't even officially become a country until 1932, about 100 years after Belgium, by the way. And historically, Saudi Arabia has been one of the most closed off conservative and religious countries in the world. But something big happened in 1938 that changed Saudi Arabia's future forever. You know, when you do these sudden serious bouts of historical facting, you just always remind me of Alice Cooper in Wayne's World, Tommy. I think one of the most interesting aspects of Milwaukee is the fact that it's the only major American city to have ever elected three socialist mayors. Um, and I've got to say, I'm not usually a fan of big geopolitical developments in the late 1930s, but pray proceed. <laughs> so that is when Saudi Arabia discovered oil. And Raj, it turns out that massive oil reserves can buy you a soccer club and a gilded seat at the geopolitical table. And not just any table. If this was, you know, a John Hughes movie, we'd be talking Letterman jackets, mm -hmm. feathered bangs, nice. and also this, a ubiquitous supply of oil. And if this was a Today High School, we'd be talking TikTok stardom, Fortnite high scores, and a shitload of natural gas. Now that's a technical term, Raj. It means I've got one. I've got one of the three. It means enough gas to get your calls returned by the president of the United States. You follow me here? Yeah. The only thing I've learned so far is that you, Tommy, might not know what the phrase technical term actually means. <laughs> but the relationship between the U.S. and Saudi Arabia has been a key element to the kingdom's global influence. In 1945, President Roosevelt and King Abdul Aziz bin Saud met on a massive Navy ship called the USS Quincy as it was anchored in the Suez Canal. It was there that they hammered out a deal to secure the U.S. access to Saudi oil in exchange for a security guarantee from Uncle Sam. So Tommy, FDR, he's traveling back from the old Yalta conference on the south coast of the Crimean Peninsula when he just finished dividing up, you know, as you do, post-war Europe with Churchill and Stalin. And he thinks, hmm, 
Let's make a pit stop in Saudi Arabia on the way home. Is that how it works? This was the ultimate gas run, Raj. <laughs> and you'll love this. According to official records of the meeting that you can find on the State Department website, the two leaders spent most of their time arguing about the future of Israel and Palestine. Oh, Tommy, the more things change, the more they stay the same. Indeed. But Roosevelt was right that Saudi Arabia would be absolutely critical to meeting America's future energy needs. And this U.S.-Saudi partnership deepened and evolved over time. The two countries worked together to combat communism and the Soviet Union during the Cold War. And then in the early 1990s, the Saudis allowed U.S. and coalition troops to operate out of Saudi Arabia during the first Gulf War. This, by the way, was a decision that made a, a rich Saudi Nepo baby named Osama bin Laden very unhappy. But that is a story for another even more depressing podcast god help us if that guy makes an appearance in will corrupt season three knock on wood uh and since 9 11 the united states and saudi arabia have worked together to combat terrorist groups like al-qaeda and i'm sure that america you know conducted ourselves in a morally principled way right you know leading with our values constantly pushing saudi leaders to do better when it comes to democracy and and you know human rights so Every team needs great role players, and per usual, my role here will be to disappoint you. And so, no, <laughs> Saudi Arabia is an absolute monarchy, meaning what the king says goes and dissent is not tolerated. And frankly, the U.S. has been pretty much fine with that setup in the name of stability. Oh, give me your tired, your poor, your huddled masses yearning for global stability. <laughs> <laughs> Unfortunately, Raj, the U.S. has a long history of working with flawed leaders as long as we share some kind of common enemy. And the latest such enemy is Iran. Remember that whole axis of evil term that George W. Bush coined? You know, Tommy, everybody focuses on that axis of evil thing. But I, I will go to my grave believing that Bush's best line of all time was this. I, I couldn't imagine somebody like... Osama bin Laden understanding the joy of Hanukkah. I think we categorize that as dumb but technically accurate, which is the standard <laughs> I aspire to here at Crooked Media. But Iran it's is a high bar. <laughs> it's a high bar for me. Iran has shown nuclear ambitions. It's friendly with all the wrong dictators. And over the years, Iran's leaders have embraced the death to America chants and vowed to wipe Israel off the map. So it's a boogeyman that the U.S. wants buffers against, and Saudi Arabia fits right in. Okay, oil, check. Deterrence, check. Tommy, once you got those two, you're kind of set for life. What could possibly go wrong now? <sighs> Unfortunately, a lot of things. Because in an absolute monarchy, everything depends on who's on the throne pulling the strings. Which brings us to a man known as MBS. U.S. President Donald Trump will host Saudi Arabia's crown prince in Washington on Tuesday. Salman's two-week stay in the U.S. includes a meeting with President Donald Trump and with U.S. business and tech leaders. The real-life prince is in town. The Saudi Arabian crown prince has booked the entire Four Seasons Hotel in Beverly Hills. Hollywood has rolled out the red carpet for the prince. Fox mogul Rupert Murdoch hosted a dinner at his Bel Air home Monday night. That's Mohammed bin Salman, the current crown prince of Saudi Arabia, and the leader responsible for bringing all that money into global soccer that you heard about in episode one. His father, Salman bin Abdulaziz, is technically the king, but he's elderly, he's said to be in failing health, and MBS has virtually been the one running the show since around 2017. Is this some kind of, you know, reverse Logan Roy situation? There are definitely some succession vibes here, except that I think the Saudi version entails you locking up your family members in the Ritz-Carlton and maybe torturing them. Sounds like Series 2, Episode 3, Bore on the Floor. <laughs> One of the greatest TV episodes of all time, Rod. That show is something for everybody. But we'll, we'll talk more about the Ritz-Carlton incident in a bit. But MBS's path to power was even more shocking, even more improbable than Tom Wamsgans. He was the sixth son of the 25th son of the founding king. Coming in at about Cousin Greg levels. <laughs> you can't make a Tomlet without breaking some Gregs, Raj. <laughs> uh, <laughs> so to, to figure this all out, we went to someone who knows this story better than almost anybody because he wrote an unbelievable book called MBS, The Rise to Power of Mohammed bin Salman. My name is Ben Hubbard. I'm the Istanbul bureau chief for The New York Times. He was just really not on anybody's radar. He was way too far down the totem pole. The way that it ended up working out is he basically got incredibly lucky. That's because in January of 2015, King Abdullah, the previous king of Saudi Arabia, died. 
which allowed MBS's father, King Salman, to become king. And against all odds, King Salman chose MBS to be crown prince, the person next in line to accede to the throne. There were lots of other people that just kind of seemed like they were more qualified. I mean, he has older brothers who are the sons of the king's first wife, who one of them has a PhD from Oxford. Another one was the first Arab astronaut. Um, you know, these are like serious people with serious education. Serious people? Oh, Tommy, respect. You've even got Ben in on the succession show. <laughs> well played, mate. You are not serious people. I can't. I wish I could do that. What an accent. World corrupt. We are nothing if not steadfast in our commitment to the bit, Raj. At the time, MBS had a BA from a Saudi university in law. Didn't really speak English. Had not spent significant time outside of the kingdom. You know, he had not studied abroad or attended a foreign university or really spent much time outside of the kingdom. But for whatever reason, his father decided that he was the one. I just love that the shift in tectonic plates of geopolitics can often just be boiled down to, he was father's favorite. It's never not incredible to me. I know, I know. But while MBS's brothers were living their jet-setting lifestyles and studying at elite universities, he was getting firsthand knowledge of how Saudi Arabia actually functioned. Here's Ben again. Um, he was basically with his father all of the time. His father for many, many years was the Prince of Riyadh, or he was sort of the, which sort of is, makes him the, kind of the equivalent of the governor. And a lot of Salman's job was to basically deal with society, to interact with society, whether it was, you know, weddings and funerals and sort of that sort of, you know, more ceremonial stuff to like actually solving problems between people. Two businessmen get in a fight over some plot of land. Sometimes they would bring it to some man and he would try to figure out who was right and who was wrong and, um, you know, lay down the law. And so MBS got this tremendous education from his father, from just being around him in Riyadh while his father is dealing with society. And, he's, and, and it teaches him sort of who are the important clerics in the religious establishment? How do they think? How do they operate? What are their relationships to each other? So I think the significant minus is that he doesn't really have any innate understanding of how Saudi Arabia's Western allies operate, how they think, how they are going to react to certain things that he wants to do. He just doesn't know because he doesn't know these societies. He never spent time there. He doesn't speak the language well. He doesn't, you know, it's not part of, it's not part of who he is. But the, the asset that he does have that ends up be, just being incredibly important is that he knows Saudi Arabia inside and out. Like the very back of his hand, Tommy. Or I should say, about as well as I know, every single fast car live bootleg performance has ever been taped. I can't think of an analogy that fits more perfectly or incongruously at the same time, Raj, but it's not enough to just have a fast car. You have to know how to use it to your advantage. Here's Ben again. When it comes time to start maneuvering, to elbow aside some of these other princes who would also like to become king, he knows how to do it. And when it comes time to shove these clerics out of the way because he wants to start driving things in a different direction, he knows who these people are in a way that some of these other princes probably don't. And so he just has this very, uh, I think, intimate knowledge of Saudi society that he's able to use. And he ends up using it to do a lot of things that I think lots of people thought were just not possible. And he does them with kind of surprising ease. So basically, if I've got your drift, Tommy, MBS, he stayed home to understand oh, the inside of the family business all the time. His siblings were off at college just crushing those twelvers of Nazi light. And when it came time for Poppers to hand over the keys to the family shop, he stepped up and he said, basically, this, this is mine now. I, I think you got the spirit of it. I think it's probably less Natty Light in the dorm room and more uh, Louis Trez Cognac and Stad. But, you know, you got the gist. But along the way, MBS took out some powerful and well-connected rivals. One of the key people MBS pushed aside was Mohammed bin Nayef, or MBN. Did, did, did the Saudis just choose these initials to make it all as confusing, as confounding as possible? Or is this just all, you know, like a, a happy Sesame Street-esque accident? Happy accident, Raj, but stick with me here. So MBN was appointed to be crown prince by King Salman in 2015. But before that, 
He spent years as a top counterterrorism official in Saudi Arabia. In that role, MBN forged really close relationships with the U.S. intelligence community. In fact, back when I was at the White House in 2010, it was MBN who provided us with this crucial tip that disrupted an al-Qaeda plot to send explosive devices to the United States on a cargo plane. You can see why former CIA directors all love this guy, but we'll get into more detail about MBN's downfall later in the show. But the gist is that he was forced to relinquish his title to MBS in 2017 in a brutal palace coup. Well, they do say if you've got to get cooed, at least do it somewhere nice, like a palace. You know, y- you have a point. In this case, though, it was a little rough. Uh, they stripped away his security detail. They withheld his blood pressure medicine and his diabetes medicine. They even threatened to rape his female family members if his family didn't step down. So this was some ugly stuff. This is godfather level darkness. But how did MBS present in the street? And uh, how does he convince the public, I, I'm the person for this job? So publicly, MBS presented himself as the guy who would root out corruption when he was crown prince. It was, he, had, he wanted to be seen as a bold, visionary reformer. Let me guess. He did all this by the book, right? Through uh, fully transparent legal proceedings, that kind of thing. I would describe it more as a forced shakedown. Oh, classic tomato, tomato situation. (laughs) But here's how the next step of this Game of Thrones style coup played out. And yes, I do know that we are mixing TV and movie metaphors at the moment, and I'm fine with it. But so, (laughs) Raj, imagine you are one of hundreds of very rich members of the royal family in Saudi Arabia. You get invited to the Ritz-Carlton in Riyadh for a gathering. So far, so good. But but your tone suggests, I'm just guessing, behind the Ritz-Carlton shower curtain is Stephen A. Smith about to jump out and yell, But! But <laughs> then oh your cousin, God. or whomever MBS is to you in the family tree, keeps you there in the hotel as prisoner and makes you sign over most of your wealth. And this actually happened. Ben detailed this in his book. They checked them all into rooms at the Ritz. They took away all their stuff. They put them in rooms where like the glass, you know, like the the glass for the showers had been taken and the cords from the curtain, you know, the curtain cords, paper cups and stuff because they didn't want anybody to try to commit suicide. And then they sent a tailor around um, who like went to the rooms, took people's measurements. And then, uh, you know, a day or two later came back with like a whole set of clothes, like basically like their five star prison outfit. <laughs> you know what they say, Tommy? Dress for the job you want, not the job you have. Uh, you're really seeing the bright side of this whole coup thing. I appreciate your positivity. But this story was a complete shock to the world when the details started coming out. And the claim that it was all in the service of fighting corruption and wasteful spending turned out to be more than a little hypocritical. Because in the years leading up to this crackdown, MBS bought a $300 million chateau in France, a $500 million yacht, and dropped $450 million on a Leonardo da Vinci painting that may or may not be fake. Oh, like a modern day Robin Hood. Without the without the giving to the poor part. <laughs> How did the rest of the Saudi population process all of this? MBS's age old political theory known as Biggie Smallsism. Give me the loot. <laughs> so it's hard to tell. Most Saudi citizens know that if you publicly criticize MBS, you're gonna get a visit from the Saudi Secret Services, so they don't speak all that freely. And on top of that, unfortunately, there's no polling that can give us a real sense for what public opinion is in Saudi Arabia. But I have to say, MBS has done some things that made him very popular with many Saudi citizens. Is this one of those classic enemy of my enemy is my friend type situation, <laughs> but with, with, with Ritz Cotton reward points <laughs> sprinkled in? No, I think this is more bread and circuses. So about 60% of the Saudi population is under the age of 30. And for them, life in Saudi Arabia could be, well, pretty boring until MBS came along and he started making what for Saudi Arabia were some pretty radical changes. MBS lifted a ban on movie theaters that had been in place for decades. He allowed men and women to attend concerts and musical events. Fast forward a couple years, Raj, and suddenly Saudi Arabia of all places is hosting massive multi-day raves and they're spending billions of dollars to host these high profile sporting events. All hail the less boring millennial prince. A less boring millennial prince with a dark side. More on that after the break. 
World Corrupt is brought to you by Zbiotics, and I've got to tell you about this game-changing product that I like to use before a night out with drinks. I've got no friends, I just go out with drinks, but it's not about me, it's about Zbiotics. <gasps> Nothing says pre-gaming like Zbiotics, Raj. Yes, you know it was invented by PhD scientists who like to tackle rough mornings after drinking. And here's how it works. You didn't ask me, but I'm going to tell you. When you drink, alcohol mm, gets converted into a toxic byproduct in the gut. Bad. And in case you missed the countless mentions in this series at this point, we are staunch gut health advocates since season one, Raj. Yeah, it's one thing that really unites you and me. But back to this byproduct, it's not dehydration that's to blame for your rough next day. Zbiotics produces an enzyme to break this byproduct down. And just remember, make Zbiotics your first drink of the night. Drink responsibly and you'll feel your best tomorrow, not today, tomorrow. And Raj, this is so important when you're on the road canvassing for a candidate you believe in and you want to unwind at night before doing it all again the next day. Well, the evening before you do what we classify at Men in Blazers as, you know, that thing, work. I think it's called shouting at the television at 7.30 a.m. in the morning, <laughs> pretending like you have any control at all over 11 human beings, kicking a ball 3,000 miles away around the field. <laughs> so if you want this amazing product from these PhD scientists, pretty happy dude scientists, go to <laughs> zbiotics.com slash corrupt to get 15% off your first order when you use corrupt at checkout. Zbiotics is backed with 100% money back guarantee so if you're unsatisfied for any reason they'll refund your money no questions asked remember go to zbiotics.com slash corrupt use the code corrupt at checkout for 15 percent off thank you zbiotics for sponsoring this episode at our good times world corrupt is brought to you by the human rights foundation an organization that we are so grateful of because they are beacons of the values that we hold near and dear here at world corrupt Oh, I'm in, Tommy. Tell me how I can get involved. I am sending you a Google Calendar invite right now, Raj, because between June 3rd to June 5th, the 2024 Oslo Freedom Forum is heading back to Norway. Home of HVIC, head <laughs> Viking in charge. Manchester City's Erling Haaland, essentially a Norwegian shack. I bet you he loves Freedom Forums. Not sure he's booked for this one, Raj, but <laughs> at the Oslo Freedom Forum, you'll hear from courageous individuals who are pushing boundaries, challenging oppression, and driving positive change. Don't miss this opportunity to be part of the global movement for freedom and democracy. Visit oslofreedomforum.com. Go today to get your tickets and use the promo code CROOKED for 40 percent off day passes. That's OsloFreedomForum.com. Use the promo code CROOKED. Now, part of Saudi Arabia's history that we haven't touched on yet is the religious aspect. The House of Saud, as it's known, has its origins with Prince Mohammed bin Saud from the mid-1700s. He aligned himself with a theologian named Mohammed bin Abdul al-Wahhab, who preached a very conservative version of Sunni Islam, a supposed purification of it that requires a literal observance of the Quran. These two men created a system that fused church and state, although there's a lot of history in there that we're not going to get to in, in full depth just for the sake of time. But these clerics, because of this relationship, have always played an incredibly powerful role in Saudi Arabia. Now, some of this I do know, Tommy, because the rules were incredibly strict. No alcohol, no public displays of affection, no sex outside of marriage, atheism prohibited, women largely kept separate from men in every public way, emphasis on public decency laws. <sighs> this list, have you guessed yet why I've never visited? Besides the straight misogyny and sexual repression, there have also been concerns in the U.S. over the years about the role of Wahhabi religious schools in the spread of extremist ideology. But for generations, this partnership between the House of Saud and these religious clerics was the foundation of the country's social and political order. The clerics gave the royal family religious legitimacy and they helped them maintain order. In return, they got enormous influence over Saudi laws, the Saudi education system, and social norms. And over the years, the Saudi royal family has slowly taken some steps to rein in the power of the clerics, but it was MBS who moved extra fast to enact social reforms and reduce the power of the religious police who monitor and enforce these rules. It was a strong signal from on high. An historic day for millions of women and their families here in Saudi Arabia. Women finally being given the green light to drive. After a 35-year ban, commercial cinemas will soon be granted licenses in Saudi Arabia. 
Saudi culture minister is calling it a watershed moment for the cultural economy. If I've got this straight, people, they can go to the movies now and women now have the right to drive. On one hand, these seem like the smallest, almost most basic consolations. They're, they're like, they're like the, the Everton Football Club of social reform. Raj, I, I just, I really thought we'd get to an Everton reference earlier. I'm a little disappointed in you. Yeah, I'm a little off my game. It's okay, buddy. But you're right. The truth is, these changes are a little basic. They seem small. But when you think about how ingrained conservatism has been in Saudi culture, it's pretty stunning how much changed overnight. We spoke with an expert on the region who said these changes made MBS extremely popular with younger Saudis. My name is Sarah Lee Whitson, and I'm the executive director of DAWN. DAWN stands for Democracy for the Arab World Now. And by the way, Sarah is also a former director of Human Rights Watch for the Middle East and North Africa. Uh, I think anyone uh, would be a fool to deny the mass popular support that Mohammed bin Salman does enjoy among the youth because he has given them what they want, which is the social cultural liberalization uh, uh, in at least some of the big cities, no longer enforcing mandatory hijab, allowing young men and women to mingle more freely, removing many of the guardianship rules that kept women unable to work freely without consent, uh, study without consent, and so forth. Um, some of these things were happening before him, but he really kind of put them on warp speed. So I think he does have a tremendous amount of popular support. Tommy, I feel like I keep coming up with the same question or a variation on it, but it, it's been repeating over and over again in my mind as I'm listening to you. With the exception of ousting his royal rival and locking up his family members in that luxury hotel, oh, which we all wish we could do from time to time. Who doesn't <laughs> want to get away? But let's be honest, for regular Saudis, things became, they became kind of good. Or, or at least better to some degree. I mean, there's some truth to that, right? I mean, like, who cares if there's no elections, free press, freedom of speech, or real economic opportunity? You go, you eat some popcorn, you watch some movies on the big screen, you let those eyes glaze over and obscure the world's problems with a little Hollywood movie magic, right? Oh, MBS, he just loves himself a bit of Paul Blart Moore Cop on the big screen. <laughs> if you remember one thing from today, dear listeners, it's this, that the mind is the only weapon that doesn't need a holster. <laughs> the Kevin James, man, the hallmark of happiness <laughs> that transcends the language barrier. I love it. But Ben Hubbard actually had a great point about how Westerners, we often wrongly assume that social liberalization and democratic reforms go hand in hand. I think there's an assumption by a lot of people in the West that social liberalization has to go hand in hand with political liberalization. And it's just not true. You know, you can be an autocrat and still be interested in people going to the movies. Um, you know, opening movie theaters and giving the women the right to drive doesn't mean that you're going to allow them to vote. <laughs> you know, they're like, and 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 I think that I think that those two things can be true much more than we probably assume in the West. Oh, Tommy, why do I feel that this is, is shifting towards something so much more than just voting rights, that, that things are about, they're about to turn really ugly? Raj, just like your favorite Paul Blart script, we are going to leave you on the edge of your seat while we take a quick break. Support for this podcast and the following message come from Wise, the account that helps you manage your money all around the world. Tommy, this may come as a bit of a shock, but I'm a human being who can barely keep track of his neon green Velcro <laughs> wallet in my own home. That is so bloody true. And why sounds like a perfect way to keep me from, you know, ferreting around in the back of taxi cabs when I think I've lost it, when I travel. So please, I'm in. Tell me more. I love when the uh, Men in Blazers producers haze you in the ad copy. Wherever life takes you, Raj, the Wise account lets you send, spend, and receive money in different currencies. Wise is the easy way to connect all your finances internationally, all without hidden fees or exchange rate markups. <sighs> Oh, God, new idea. Next series of World Corrupt going to be just all about putting an end to exchange rate markups. <laughs> <laughs> Wise works in over 160 countries, so your money's always at your fingertips. As for speed, over half of transfers get to their destination in less time than it takes to listen to this ad. Wise is the best way to make your money work across borders. Minimum fees, maximum ease, full speed. Join 16 million customers and learn how the Wise account could work for you by downloading the app or visiting wise.com slash crookedworld. Wise. 
World Corrupt brought to you by, oh, I love this, Magic Spoon. I love spooning, Tommy. I'll tell you, all this talk of Saudi politics get in the way of us tackling the real issues. Such as? Cereal. You know, when I first moved to the United States and I walked into my very first grocery store in this nation, there were so many bloody options that hadn't even been invented yet in Britain that I was, like, overwhelmed. You, you think Oliver Twist was being offered fruity peanut butter cocoa flakes? No, he was eating sludge and he had to like it, Thomas. <laughs> More, sir. Uh, <laughs> wait till I tell you and Oliver about Magic Spoon then, Raj, because they are offering all the flavors you love with high protein and less sugar. Oh, please tell me they got a variety pack. What do you know, Raj? They do, and it offers four flavors. You got cocoa, fruity, frosted, and peanut butter. Mm. This pack has zero grams of sugar, 13 to 14 grams of protein, and four to five grams of net carbs. There are only 140 calories per serving. It's high protein, has zero grams of sugar. It's keto-friendly, gluten-free, grain-free, and soy-free. America. <laughs> Go to magicspoon.com slash corrupt to grab a variety pack and try it today. And be sure to use our promo code corrupt at checkout to save $5 off your order. And Magic Spoon is so confident in their product, it's backed with a 100% happiness guarantee. So if you don't like it for any reason, they'll refund your money, no questions asked. Remember, start the new year off right with a delicious bowl of high protein cereal at magicspoon.com slash corrupt and use the code corrupt to save $5 off. Thank you, Magic Spoon, for sponsoring sponsoring this episode. Thank you, Magic Spoon. At first, MBS convinced a lot of people that he was a sincere modern reformer. And frankly, a lot of people in the U.S. embraced him. On his first trip to the U.S. in 2018, MBS went to the White House. He visited tech leaders in Silicon Valley, and he got gauzy, wonderful puff pieces from the New York Times in 60 Minutes. But back home, MBS's dark side had been steadily revealing itself. Here's a couple of his least greatest hits. Oh, Tommy, it's very difficult to sell a least greatest hits album. Unless you're Limp Biscuit. Ugh, the, the least delicious biscuit of them all. <laughs> but let me go through the list here. So MBS launched and steadily escalated a war in Yemen that led to what the United Nations calls the world's worst humanitarian crisis. That's one. Two, he took the prime minister of Lebanon hostage and tried to force him to resign. Wait, 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 wait. I'm, so, I'm sorry, did you say... MBS took the prime minister of another country hostage. Are you sure that's not like a script that's crossed your desk for the latest Taken sequel? The one that comes after the writers are completely <laughs> out of ideas? It was absolutely bonkers. If we can find a soccer nexus, that's World Corrupt Season 4. But third, MBS launched a blockade on Qatar that lasted years. Oh, how can he do that to lovely little Qatar? The world's true home of global football. Oh, man, these are some high-stakes power moves, Tommy. They really are. And the same day that MBS gave women the right to drive, he jailed some of the most prominent women's rights activists in the country who had been fighting for that right for years. But it didn't stop there. Here's Sarah Lee Whitson again. There's a lot of punishment for anyone who expresses a critical opinion, even on social media. And in fact... Criticizing the royal family, criticizing the crown prince is defined as a terrorist offense in the country under its terrorism law, for which the sentence is death, or can be death, I should say. It's not the only sentence that can be given. It has become much more a regime of fear where people are afraid uh, to express opinions. I've had uh, uh, many uh, Saudis say to me that it feels like Iraq under Saddam. You just cannot in any way, manner, shape, or form, criticize the government, criticize the royal family. Women, students, uh, uh, recent graduates who have received sentences of 45 years and 35 years uh, for tweeting uh, about uh, uh, changes that they want to see in the country, reforms they want to see in the country. And, and I'm talking really mild stuff. I'm not, these are not people who are calling for destruction or revolution or anything like that. You have thousands of royal family members who cannot lead the country now. They've done nothing. They've never been charged with anything, but they're effectively prisoners inside the country because Mohammed bin Salman does not want people to leave the country and think they can Uh, speak freely. Now, there's a lot happening inside of Saudi Arabia that we can't get a full accounting of. But there's one story that is now widely known throughout the world because it didn't happen on Saudi soil. Then it was a brazen example of MBS defying all international laws and emerging with blood on his hands. That's the story of Jamal Khashoggi. 
This is a Fox News alert. We are just getting word out of Riyadh that Saudi officials are now saying that Jamal Khashoggi, the Saudi uh, journalist who was a columnist also for the Washington Post, did in fact die inside the Saudi consulate in Istanbul, Turkey. It's a very sad situation. It's a very bad situation. And we want to get to the bottom of it. Did you order the murder of Jamal Khashoggi? Uh, Absolutely not. This was a heinous crime. But I take full responsibility as a leader in Saudi Arabia. A U.S. intelligence report has concluded that Saudi Crown Prince Mohammed bin Salman personally approved the murder of the exiled journalist Jamal Khashoggi in 2018. This was a, a singular, atrocious and shocking act, Tommy. And, and I remember following the news as it happened and the details came out. And if our listeners aren't familiar, Khashoggi, he was a journalist. He wrote for progressive publications or what passed as progressive publications as much as they were allowed within Saudi Arabia. He even worked for the former Saudi ambassador to the United States and the United Kingdom. He was seen, seen as a Saudi insider, a critic, yes, uh, an influential journalist, definitely. Uh, and he fled the country in 2017 when MBS took control and made it very clear that there would be no room at all for press freedom. So after leaving Saudi Arabia, Khashoggi lived in basically self-imposed exile in Virginia and wrote for the Washington Post as a columnist. In late September of 2018, during a visit to Turkey, Khashoggi visited the Saudi consulate in Istanbul. He needed to get official documents to prove that he was divorced so that he could marry his then fiance, a Turkish academic. The consulate employees told Khashoggi, no problem come back in a few days. And so on October 2nd, Jamal Khashoggi entered the Saudi consulate again in Istanbul, and he never came back out. A truly horrifying act, which the Saudis, they initially denied. They certainly tried, but it turns out that Turkey's intelligence services had that consulate building completely wired. And soon the Turkish government went public with the truth. Khashoggi had been gruesomely murdered in the embassy and his body was dismembered. Shortly after, U.S. intelligence assessed that the operation against Khashoggi was personally approved by MBS. So Dawn, the organization that Sarah is the executive director of, it was actually founded by Khashoggi. Jamal had wanted to found an organization that would advocate for the interests of the Saudi people, that would advocate for the interests of Saudi civil society, Middle East civil society, uh, for freedom from justice from a place where he thought he could do that. Uh, freely, and that was Washington, D.C., and he believed that uh, it was important to push the U.S. government uh, to stop supporting these abusive regimes who were stifling democracy and freedom. I think he believed more than I did um, that the U.S. was ultimately a force of good and could exercise its leverage and voice for good uh, in the region. I think that was also deeply threatening to Mohammed bin Salman. Uh, uh, I think just he took it as an affront or an assault that Jamal Khashoggi, who was extremely well known, had millions of followers on Twitter, widely respected throughout the country, would be speaking freely and independently uh, and critically about the country. And uh, to do so from an organization like Dawn that would have power was doubly threatening to him. Uh, and I think that's why he killed him. So Raj, let's take a moment after this horrific story to remind our listeners about why we're doing this series to begin with. Because this is a leader who imprisons people for tweets, who holds his own family members hostage, who held the Lebanese prime minister hostage, and murders a journalist in another country. And as we covered in episode one, he's also at the head of the country and that PIF, remember? The Saudi Public Investment Fund, which of course, those two things, Saudi Arabia and the PIF. Remember, if you only take one thing from this podcast, totally unconnected. Nothing to do with the government at all, not connected. Yep, he just happens coincidentally to be at the head of these entities that are not so slowly becoming a major force in the most popular sport in the world by acquiring clubs, luring the world's biggest stars to the Saudi Domestic League with truckloads of cash, hosting the 2034 World Cup, that global jewel, also bidding for the 2035 Women's World Cup. I crap you not, yes, more on that World Cup in an upcoming episode. 
And we're going to hear more about how MBS is buying and controlling the tech world, the film industry, the random apps we use every day. MBS is becoming ubiquitous. It doesn't stop at sports. And that's why we need to know about his vindictive personality and the Saudi human rights abuses. It is so, so important, Raj. And, you know, while it can be challenging to get first person accounts of events happening inside Saudi Arabia, there are also people being victimized by MBS who live overseas. We want to introduce you to one of those people. Yeah, so my name is Khalid Al-Jabri. Khalid's father is Dr. Saad Al-Jabri. Post 9-11, he was the main liaison partner in counterterrorism between Saudi Arabia and the United States and the rest of the Five Eyes. Not nah, holding out song. <laughs> Close. The Five Eyes is the name of an intelligence sharing partnership between the US, the UK, Canada, Australia, and New Zealand. He was also the right-hand man for the former crown prince that we spoke about earlier, MBN. So, since MBN was MBS's chief political rival, his former right-hand man also became a prime target. But MBS doesn't just stop at his direct foes, he also goes after their families. In June of 2017, uh, when MBS became crown prince after a palace coup in Saudi Arabia uh, that saw the former crown prince, my dad's chaperone, uh, or patron, uh, disappeared and, and, and put under house arrest, uh, things took a nasty turn for my family. We became political targets of MBS, given my dad's long-term relationship with the former crown prince, and we got entangled in a royal feud. Fortunately, at that point, most of my family members, and we're a big family, we're six boys, two girls, my mom and dad, all of them were outside, with the exception of Omar and Sarah. They were 16 and 17 years old at that point. And uh, initially, uh, on MBS's first day as Crown Prince, first morning, first order of business, he put them on a travel ban, preventing them from flying to Boston to go back to their schools. Um, and three years later, at the beginning of COVID in uh, 2020, uh, they were kidnapped from our home in Riyadh and disappeared, and nobody has seen them since then. This March, it will be four years. Um, recently, the UN um, Working group in arbitrary detention um, declared that their detention was unlawful, illegal. Uh, they called for their immediate release and they referred uh, their case to the special rapporteur on torture and, this, and the group working on enforced disappearances. Khaled's father's in exile in Canada now and he's actually filed several lawsuits against MBS, two in the United States, one in Canada, accusing MBS of, of sending a, yes, a hit squad to kill him. A hit squad that was apprehended at the Canadian border. Oh, God love those Mounties. Khaled's family story is terrifying, of course, and it gives us a window into the extreme lengths that MBS will go to. But big picture, it also raises a lot of questions about the future of Saudi Arabia. MBS is spending like there's no tomorrow. But as Khaled pointed out, when you go after the family members of people that you have grudges against, he's also chasing away talented young people who could be the key to a future healthy Saudi society. Khaled is a cardiologist. He's a tech entrepreneur. He's someone who wishes he could return to Saudi Arabia. You know, I became a you know, fully specialized cardiologist at the age of 32. Half of my life was studying in, in, in public schools and sponsored by the Saudi government. My goal, my dream was to be trained at the best institution in the U.S. and then take that knowledge back to Saudi Arabia. Like, I dedicated my life to that. So you can imagine, you know, like, put everything that we're going through as a family aside, but for somebody to work so hard for a goal and then literally wake up seven days before the finish line, because I was about to finish my fellowship in, at Tufts in Boston, and, you know, my life has changed. I can't go back to Saudi for something I haven't done or for, like, something I'm not even involved in. I deliberately didn't want to get involved in politics. I chose medicine because I don't want to get involved in politics. And it's pretty tough. So if you tell me today, you know, Khaled, you can actually go back to Saudi Arabia. You'll be untouched. You'll be you. You'll fulfill your dreams. You'll have complete freedom. Nobody's going to harm your family. I'll take an Uber to Dallas right now with a one-way ticket. Uh, but I don't think anybody can guarantee that. That Tommy, that not being able to return home, that that is daunting. Seems like such a basic desire, a basic freedom, a basic longing, and it's one that begs a question. Why? Why, despite everything detailed in this episode, the crackdown on dissent, the social inequity, the murder of Jamal Khashoggi, why do tech leaders, why do political leaders, why do they all come back to Saudi Arabia? And why do footballers keep flocking there? So, Raj, we're going to get into all of that and much, much more, including something called Vision 2030, which is MBS's plan for a more diverse economy since the world is trying to move away from fossil fuels. Oh, so it's the world's fault. 
<laughs> and we're also going to talk about how despite all of this that you've laid out in quite painful uh, often traumatic detail Saudi Arabia has still been awarded the world's biggest accolade the world's greatest jewel the world's greatest spotlight the world's biggest global football competition the world cup and yes and this i mean is is mind-bending is somehow still in the running and is considered a favorite by many to host the 2035 women's world cup no 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 not even fifa could let that happen raj the gulf state world cup hosting will continue until morale improves. <laughs> Are you sure it's not a hole in out song? <laughs>